Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Greetings of peace and blessings upon you. Welcome to the Muslim house. <laughs> the Muslim Public Affairs Council established the Muslim house in 2021, and this is our second in-person event. My name is Habib Vera. I'm a board member of MPAC and currently serving as the board chair of the MPAC Hollywood Bureau. I immigrated from Mumbai, India to Los Angeles with my family as a teenager. As a young person, I had a sense of the power of media, how it shapes personal and social narratives, influencing how we relate to one another, and dreamed of playing a role in filmmaking. But sadly, I did not see myself represented on screen or in print. My young fantasies were quashed by voices that said I didn't belong. By God's grace, as I look around this room this evening, I'm certainly encouraged. The human story, the American story, as told in the media, is incomplete without your stories. My faith compels me to seek truth and work towards establishing justice in this world. This is why I serve MPAC and build community with MPAC. And this is why I'm dedicated to empowering you and amplif amplifying your beautiful voices and stories. On behalf of the MPAC team, I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation to the Doris Duke Foundation for recognizing our work and having faith in us to join in our efforts. Many thanks to Sam Gill, Zeba Rahman, <laughs> Alicia Weston, and the entire team at the Doris Duke Foundation for their support for tonight's activation of the Muslim House. <laughs> Through their Building Bridges program, Doris Duke supports the work of so many Muslim creatives across the country. And the funding is so critical to changing perspectives of our community and to ensuring that our stories get told. You'll hear more from their leadership throughout tonight's impactful program. I have the distinct honor and pleasure now of handing it over to my dear sister, Sue Abedi. Like many of you, in my difficult hours, I have leaned on Sue and she's been a steady source of positive reinforcement, and for that, I am eternally grateful. Sue Bedi. Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. Before I begin, Zeba, Sam, would you mind standing up and greeting the crowd? Just a couple of housekeeping items. Please enjoy. Please, please have a great time. I want to also um, let you know in, in Muslim culture, we love to eat, so please enjoy. Please. Um, restrooms, accessible restrooms are in the back as well, so if anybody needs it, you do not have to go outside. And I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace to you and your families. And before I begin, I always have to say that all praise is due to God, first and foremost. Thank you, Habib, for your support and leadership in shaping the vision of the Hollywood Bureau and the Muslim House, and thank you for your friendship. I want to echo Habib and express my deepest gratitude to the Doris Duke Foundation for their support of tonight's event. Sam Gill and Zeba Rahman, your dedication to amplifying Muslim voices and fostering understanding in diverse communities has been incredibly valuable. We appreciate you and we love being in your space. I want to also express our sincerest appreciation to the Sundance leadership team. The, these are incredibly difficult times, but you always manage to pull off an amazing festival. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you to the Solid Gold team that I had the privilege of working with this year. Doug Flint, I don't know where anybody is, but just, yeah. Doug Flint, Mike McCrane, Amy Cutter, 
Ashley Francis, Marianne Benazera, and Holden Payne, and all the people in the AV box back there. Um, thank you so much. And to our beloved Mary Sadegi, who is in corporate partnerships and also serves on the Hollywood Bureau Advisory Council. And I also want to congratulate Lena Barakat um, as the newest member of our Advisory Council. She's, this is her first Sundance, so enjoy. And don't walk on the ice. Um, also, I want to thank our panelists and our moderators for tonight, um, and my beloved sister, Hanan. Um, she has a play-by-play -play for everything I do in my life, and, and it, that's the way it is, so I, I love her dearly. And lastly, thank you to the most important people at the festival, here and on the streets of Park City, braving the crowds, the cars, and the climate, the volunteers. So please give it up to them for them. We want everyone to have a great experience and, and let us embrace the diversity that makes events like the Muslim House so enriching. Respect and understanding are the foundation for building a more inclusive and harmonious world. So as we engage meaningful conversations tonight, let us keep that in mind. As we come together to explore narratives within the Muslim community, I want to acknowledge what is most on our minds right now in this moment, and that's the current conflict in Palestine-Israel. This conflict did not begin a thousand years ago, nor did it begin on October 7th. It's crucial to underscore that this conflict is not about religion, but rather a struggle for the freedom, safety, and human dignity we all deserve. There are forces out there that want to see Muslim and Jewish communities at odds with each other. And in the spirit of unity, no matter what faith group you belong to, if any, I urge everyone to resist the schism between Muslims and our Jewish brothers and sisters to deepen. As God tells us in the Quran, he created, us, he created us diverse so that we can come to learn and know each other and not despise one another. Let us embrace a future that the Almighty tells us is possible, a future without hate. <laughs> There is no military solution to this conflict, but only a diplomatic one. Impact calls for a ceasefire. It calls for the release of all hostages, and it calls for the end of the occupation. Israel and a free Palestine can exist at the same time. Thank you for all for being here and this, this journey with us. Many of you have come here before. We hope that the stories and people you encounter within the Muslim House tonight and in the future inspire thoughtful reflections and meaningful conversations, but most of all, concrete and everlasting change. And now I'd like to introduce a warrior in the Muslim, American Muslim community, a, a woman who is a trailblazer and is a quiet giant. Deba Rahman is the director of the Building Bridges program at the Doris Duke Foundation. And you're just amazing and a powerhouse. And thank you so much. Please give it up for, Dor for Zeba Rahman. Okay. All right. So please join me in giving, giving it up once again to the indomitable Sue Ubedi. Salam to everyone. A warm welcome to all of you on this cold night from the Doris Duke Foundation. We're just so proud to be here today with you. This is a dream come true, really, for us. The Foundation's mission is to build a more creative, a more equitable, and sustainable future. And we do that by investing in artists, the performing arts, environmental conservation, medical research, child well-being, and greater mutual understanding amongst diverse communities. The Building Bridges program is a flagship program of the foundation, and we work with US Muslims. We work to increase mutual understanding and well-being amongst diverse communities. And we do it for more inclusive 
and stronger communities. I mean, it should be common sense, right? Um, we're committed to it, we're resolute, especially in these times. And today we have some news to share. But before I say anything, I'd like to invite to the stage Iman Zawahiri and Donald Young. Come a little closer. Come a little, come a little closer. There we go, there we go. Okay, so we're just bursting with pride and so thrilled to announce a new $6 million initiative to accelerate and support U.S. Muslim storytellers. <laughs> Our inaugural grantees are standing before you. The Center for Asian American Media is going to launch a U.S. Muslim documentary fund of 4.5 million. The Islamic Scholarship Fund is going to work with emerging and more seasoned filmmakers to really give them practical and immersive experiences along with structured learning, and they're going to do it in a very unique way. They're piloting here at, to, this year at Sundance. Some of the fellows are here. We're very excited about this. It's a historic program. Just so proud, just so proud of you. And last but not least, we're supporting MPAC's Hollywood Bureau and Muslim Houses. Our dream is to see Muslim Houses in all the important festivals throughout the US. Of course, we're going for world domination, but we'll start here. <laughs> so um, MPAC, as you can see, has built something amazing with Muslim House at Sundance. But we're going to also do it at South by Southwest. I hope you'll join us there in March and over the next years to come, and also Tribeca Film Festival. So this is a real celebration. I'm going to now introduce you to the person who has really stood by the Building Bridges program, who's really believed in our vision and our ideas, and that's our CEO, Shamshir Singh Gill. I want to invite Sam to the stage. He's a phenomenal thinker and a visionary, and I'm just so proud to work with you, Sam. So, Thank you. Thank you. Sam's, going to, Sam's going to lead a fireside chat, and he's going to take it from here. Take it away, Sam. All right. Sam. Thanks, <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Zeba. Let me just uh, invite uh, our panelists, Dean and Maizun, to the stage. Uh, and while they're coming to the stage, just want to uh, add our, first of all, our congratulations to these new grantees. We are just so excited uh, to be investing in this work and accelerating it, yes. Um, thank you to Habib, thank you to Sue, thank you to Sundance. This is incredible. It is incredible to be here tonight. This is so fun. Um, so uh, I am really lucky to be joined on stage by uh, Maysoon Zaid, uh, and, yes, <laughs> and Dino Badala. Uh, they both have incredibly illustrious, distinguished careers and backgrounds, but the one thing you need to know is they're hilarious. And what we're really gonna talk about uh, tonight is the, not only the power of, but the importance of humor and comedy um, to help to confront hate and intolerance, to help to bring people together, especially in moments like, like these. Um, and so I think we should just get into it. Yeah. Um, so the, I, what I, where I'd love to start is, you know, of one of the things that you both are known for is the creation of now a, really a 20 year institution, which is the Arab American Comedy Festival. Um, so we started in high school. We started it freshman year in high exactly. school. Exactly. It was like that or yearbook. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but tell us, especially because the moment we're in now, tell us about how that started, why that started. Yes. Um, so like most Muslim girls in America growing up, I had a dream. And my dream was to be on the daytime soap opera General Hospital. <laughs> so the logical way 
for like an oppression Olympics winner, which is me because I'm Muslim, I'm a woman of color, divorced, disabled, from Jersey, it's a lot. The way for me to break into Hollywood was comedy. Why? Because Hollywood shuns disability and they're not huge fans of brown people. Um, and I started my comedy career one year before 9-11 and at my very third show, I walked in and I met Dean Obidala. And after 9-11, he contacted me and said, we should do something to counter the negative images of Muslims in media post 9-11. And he had a big dream and we haven't achieved it yet, but he wanted to teach Americans the difference between Arabs and Muslims. We're still trying to do it. They're not futile, really Futile endeavor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, but so, but Dean, like what was the reaction? Anger, no, it was fine. It was <laughs> We, we started the festival in 2003. We were doing shows before that here in New York. And people were coming out. Like, we're like, they're Arabs. Is there, is there I don't think you're Is your mic on? on? Yeah. Have you ever used a, have yeah, you ever used a long the microphone, performance. Dean? Yeah, long, long. Yeah. He's new to this, everybody. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. There, can someone help this man? <laughs> so while, while he's struggling, yeah. Got it? Um, any, wait, it's, it's, it's on. It's warming no. up. Right? All right, here we go. Hello. No. no. This is, Hello. This is a conspiracy of silence Palestinian voices at Sundance. <laughs> they are not going to stop us at wait, Muslim test. House. Hey, look all right. Back. Yeah, see? Hey. Right, so. Allah, Everybody. Allah, Everybody. Allah. Everybody. Right, we'll edit that one. I, so, so what was it like? Can I, first of all, can I just say, everyone who came tonight, thank you, and you're all Muslim now. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Listen, Alhamdulillah. Enjoy the beet hummus. That's all you're eating from now on. That's it. How what, look, look, in the beginning, Sam, we didn't know if people were going to come out. Literally, we started the festival in 2003, two years after 9-11. The Iraq War had just begun. And we're like, let's do comedy. People are going to love us. And we didn't know. We couldn't even find enough Arab comics to be in it. We had actors who were slightly funny. We're like, you got to be in our festival. <laughs> and that's how it started. So that, And then people started coming out. And we never planned it to go more than one year. And then the crowd came out, and the community came out, and comedians came out. And every year we had the same pledge. If people come out from the community, they still think it's relevant, we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. And then 20 years later, we've continued that. And the whole goal was to break negative stereotypes, but also to create a platform for other Arab Americans to go, hey, someone in this industry might actually listen to me or give me a platform to be funny on. And we were happy, like Rama Yusuf was a 19-year-old kid from Jersey, and he came in our festival. He never did stand-up. He did sketch comedy. Others, the same thing. So it began very humbly. We had no plans that it would last for 20 years, and here we are. So it lasted for 20 years, and here we are. And, and as we did it, one of the main focuses, and I, I was really impressed at the beginning of this event, that this is very much Muslim women-led. And we have nothing against you, Sam, but it was basically Muslim women on the stage before. And for all of us at the Arab Comedy Festival, it was so important to counter comedy. Comedy is men. It's a man-driven industry. And Dean and I have always been extraordinarily committed to having at least 50% representation of women on our stage. And the level of comedy at the festival now is absolutely extraordinary. Because Doris Duke helped us, we were able to do a show on Broadway, November 19th, and it was, it was such an incredible venue. We had Tony Shaloub, who's like a pioneer in comedy with us, and 20 years later, we had the most shocking thing in festival history, I believe, happen, which was our club canceled us for the end of this month, uh, for the end of next month. For the first time in our careers, our show was canceled. We just got canceled. So when we not, talk, but it's not canceled like the panel after us. It's like literally. I think it's, We couldn't do the show. I think it's they won't a little let us do bit the show. both. Yeah, and and we 
it's a month out, so it's gone. And so, but we do have the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, but like when we started this and we told people it's an Arab comedy festival, there were some people who were like, no. But then by year 10, every club wanted us because we were always selling out and bringing these big names. And when I got that call literally a day before I got here, I was like, oh my gosh, the discrimination, the hatred, the fear of Palestinians and Muslims is so severe that I'm getting dropped by my representation. Our shows are getting canceled. We're not getting booked, but look at Muslim house, mashallah. If we build our own systems, we don't have to depend on the people who want to silence us. So please, another round of applause for Doris Duke. Yeah. What do you, so let's... Um, let's lighten wanna, it up. I want to, uh, yeah, I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to ask about, about that, right, which is, you know, on, uh, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's, you, you, you can get a sense in this moment of how precarious mm -hmm. progress can be. But on the other hand, I think it is inspiring to hear you amazing and say like, look, no, but we can, now we know we can build these things. What did, what did you guys learned over the last 20 years about what needs to be built? About what needs to be built so that, because moments like this are inevitable, moments of fear, moments of retrenchment. What do, what do we need to build so that when those moments come, we're addressing them with more stories, with more jokes, with difference. I think the one thing, the actual ways of doing that, we can discuss and you can have different approaches. I think it has to be our attitude. Everyone here has to understand, progress is not permanent, okay? We're learning that firsthand. I made a documentary in 2013, I'm a filmmaker, by the way, <laughs> called The Muslims Are Coming. Has anyone ever heard of it, Muslims Are Coming? Oh, a few people. It was five Muslim American comics. We went to Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama. Three of us made it back. Utah. We went to Utah. The second leg, second leg, we came over here. But the point was, 2013, we make this documentary, and it got in some festivals, we got some distribution. People were like, well, things are better for you Muslims, right? And they were. It was 2013. Obama's in the White House. Anti-Muslim bigotry was not where it was after 9-11. Who do, we didn't know a year and a half later Donald Trump would come in and call for a complete and total shutdown on Muslims coming to this country. And the result was we saw the biggest spite of anti-Muslim hate crimes worse than after 9-11 in 2015 and 16. So the point is, all of us, the attitude said you never lose faith that progress is not permanent. And we're living through that now beyond our community. If you're black in America, August 1965, you are more voting rights protection than you did today because that's when the Voting Rights Act was signed. But in 2013, it was gutted by a GOP Supreme Court. If you're a woman, you had more protections in 1973 than you do today in 2024. Progress is not permanent. The powers on the right, the regressive, repressive ones, they're not going anywhere. They're fighting us. So we're dealing it on a small level with our comedy at a club that we know the owner who loves us. Who loves and us. And he wants, <laughs> not anti-Arab or anti-Muslim. He's afraid of are there gonna be bomb threats? Are there gonna be hate crimes? And underneath it, he's afraid, is it gonna hurt his business to be associated with Arabs right now and what we're living through in New York City? So the idea is, we're not gonna give up. You have to have a thick skin. Remember, progress is not permanent. The fight continues over and over and over. There's different ways of doing it, different storytelling. You're funding documentaries, what a great way. And comedy is such a great vessel to tell your story, because if you're gonna have a serious film, or serious speech, certain people come. Comedy, they come in, they don't know what's gonna hit them, you slip the message in, yeah. that's what you do. That's, that's the best way of doing it, like all the time, that's what we did, and, and even for our own community, I would give pep talks, I'm like, look, it's bad for us yeah. Muslims, it could be worse, they give hurricanes Muslim names, that wouldn't help. <laughs> Turn on the news, Hurricane Mahmoud is coming. <laughs> Run for your life, Mahmoud's a killer. So you use comedy when you can. What do you, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna. Sam, to bump, to bump on that, I honestly think the most important thing for our community is the talent. Work on your craft. I, I don't wanna say this to you, but I'm gonna 
It's, I, it's the advice you don't want to hear. You're going to have to work 10 times harder than everyone else. It's completely unfair, but when you get that chance, your talent needs to be at that level. So a lot of people think that when they come to the comedy festival, it's like, oh, it's cute, a bunch of Arabs trying to make jokes. No, this is top level talent. So I think number one, you have to make sure your craft is there. And two, I, I, I'm a broken record on this, people, because I have some cerebral palsy. Be inclusive from the beginning. Do not be a minority community that isn't inclusive. So yes, Muslims, we're going to need to make our spaces inclusive of disabled people. We need to make our spaces inclusive of LGBTQ people. We need to make a, yeah, we must be trailblazers in inclusivity. Look at this beautiful space that Doris Duke has created for us an impact, God bless you guys, mashallah, has created tonight. Sundance has been an absolute nightmare for me. The entire place is inaccessible. This space is completely accessible from top to bottom. It can be done, and I think that's really important for us. You, so. so let's, um, I wanna, I want to, um, I wanna pull on this thread more about what is, what will it mean to engineer an entertainment industry for inclusion? Something you reminded me of, uh, Maisun, before we came on stage was when you got a book contract yeah. <laughs> um, for, for Tiny Misfits, which you know, was an amazing project to be a part of. One of the things, it didn't even occur to us until you called Zeba that you have challenges typing. And there was no provision from the publisher in the advance to help you to actually type out the book. Like, you know, physical inclusion is just table stakes, but like thinking about what it means. But so can we extend that to the, all of the barriers that Muslim, that, that Muslim creators are gonna face? Like what are the other things that we need to, to, to build on this energy? What are the real things that Hollywood needs to do that the entertainment needs to do to engineer for creativity, to be intentional, or inclusion, to be intentional about inclusion? Well, first of all, Honestly, I know I've done the round of applause thing, but you have to clap for them for the typist. The, I called Zeba. I got this huge contract to make Shiny Misfits, this incredible dream project. It's a comic book. I'm a comic book fan. I got a chance to write a powerful Muslim kid without like any of the borders or the politics. And suddenly I was like, I can't type and they're not giving me a typist, what do I do? And I don't cry unless something heavy falls on me, and I called Zeba bawling. And I said, what do I do? And she said, you apply for a grant, and we pay for your typist. And I said, that, that doesn't happen, especially not in the middle of COVID. They gave me my typist, and we were able to deliver the manuscript in four months thanks to what they did. So to answer Sam's question, I think that, again, if you have power, if you are already a director or a producer, bring people up with you. Dean and I, whenever we do stuff, his radio show, he brought in Nina Karufa, a Muslim producer. My team is all women. My team is all women, not because I'm a Muslim woman who can't be around men, but because I'm sick of you patriarchy and I'm tearing you down. So like, I think that we have, we have the power and we must stop apologizing. So many Muslim people walk into the room and they're like, I'm sorry, I condemn terrorism, I condemn everything. Is there any way I could be a gapper? Like, we need Muslims in every single position and we need to not be okay with one person makes it. We're like, oh my gosh, one person made it, that's enough. I told you, I feel like Hollywood has really shunned Muslim women. We are represented in commercials, we're in sports, we're on stage, but when it comes to mainstream media, like, The View has never had a Muslim host, but they have had 20 years of anti-Muslim rhetoric and nothing to go against it. So when you think of who are the big Muslim talents, thank God Senna Khan and Miss Marvel have given us something to look at, but we don't have that. So we need to have our men in power positions look around and go, oh, wait a minute, 
there's no one that can, you know, is a woman here, let's bring them up. So the people who have power need to use that power to include us. Dean, what about you? Engineering for inclusion. What does Hollywood need to do? He only likes white men. He doesn't want to include anyone. First, first of all, just to be clear, I am half Palestinian, and I'm half Sicilian, <laughs> and I'm not genetically designed for this cold, okay? <laughs> Can we do the Aruba Film Festival? Is that the... I am so designed for Aruba, just so I put that. Look, I, I work more in the news media field now. I have worked in the entertainment field before. I used to be a full-time comic and made a documentary and did a lot of other pitching TV shows. I can speak more to the news media side where our voices, if you're speaking on behalf of Muslims, maybe it's okay. If you're speaking about Palestinian humanity, to be blunt, you're taking your career into your own hands. You're risking not having a job anymore. That's the world we live in, and that is an unreal world where I have to worry about talking about the humanity of my family in Palestine or the West Bank. So for us, can entertainment stories help tell a, a great, humanize us, make us more accessible? Sure. Do, am I worried about Palestinians in the entertainment field as well going forward? Yeah, I am. And am I concerned about we're going to see content which demonizes Palestinians going forward? Absolutely. And you're going to see that. You know you're going to do that. But the beauty is I think now things have so democratized, there are filmmakers here with the support of Dewar's Duke Foundation, Impact, other organizations. You can make your own films, your own projects, get them out there. And maybe it won't be a, a paramount film, but it is still a chance for distribution a chance for streaming, people can see it, we tell our stories, and that's how we define who we are, telling our stories, and it's gonna be, I think the next year is gonna be really challenging, to be blunt. Can I, can I bump on that too? Uh, there are people who do have faith in us, like when everything happened, my scholastic editor immediately called me up, and she was like, we've got your back, we support you. And when we talk about being given platforms, I, I am going to take this platform to say, I got back from Palestine last week, everybody. Last week, I was there. This is a mass disabling event. For every one child slaughtered, three are now disabled. And we have this platform right here, and I have to say it, and I have to say it right now. Every single child, regardless of faith, deserves equality. If anyone in this room supports the killing of a child because you think it makes you safer, you are a monster and you need help. Please, everybody, use your voices to stop the slaughter. It must end. No other child should die after today. Please, I'm begging you. I'm burning my career to the ground anyway, so I might as well go at it. Can I actually um, thank you for that? I mean, what did over the 20 years of the Arab American Comedy Festival, over your careers, how did you and other comics navigate what you just deftly and powerfully walked us through, Maysoon, which is I can imagine sometimes there's pressure, like, it's just, let's just keep it about the jokes. Let's yeah. just keep it light. And then there's some, no, it's just a political speech act. If it's not for something bigger, it doesn't count. As You're not part of our community anymore. You should be standing up. How did, how did you and the comics navigate these discussions? Uh, well, when they tell me I should be standing up, I remind them I have cerebral palsy and I'll fall down. <laughs> That's the joke to keep it light after the genocide speech. Um, we love, I mean, I love what I do. Like Dean said, he's more, he hosts a radio show, Sirius XM, Channel 127 Progress, Drive Time, Thank 6 you, to 9, 3 to 6. Um, and every you can listen thing, online. By the, every other thing we're going to say is a plug for something we're working on. Uh, San Francisco, February 10th, Hill, Kenny Center. Uh, April 16th, Shiny Misfits comes out. I could do this the whole time. But we love what we do. Like when we do these shows on the road, we've got 15 minutes left, everyone. Pay attention to Sue. Um, we love what we do. And so the way that we navigate it, at least with me, and especially with the younger comics, because We've mentored comics because it has been 20 years. There are people that came to our shows at 16 and 17 and became comics. And when stuff like this happens and they're stripped of representation or they're scared or they just 
don't know how to write jokes anymore, we take care of each other. We help each other out. We listen to each other. And if any of us steal jokes, we send them to the Sicilian to deal with. But did you, I mean, did you guys have, well, did you guys, did you guys, but we're not stereotyping anyone here. Did you guys, <laughs> did you guys? Is there a Sicilian house I can go to? Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is ridiculous. How did you? Did you? Did, you, did, did you have? Did you have? It, are, either you or did you have comics that you've worked with where, like their families, communities they came from, said you're making light, like you're making light of situations that we think are serious, like have those sorts of issues come up? Yeah, I mean, we have a comedian who started off wearing wearing hijab, which hijab as a choice. Hijab is when you we when you cover your hair as a Muslim woman. Hijab as a choice should be respected like any other choice. She chose to take off the hijab and she chose to live a much more liberal kind of open life. And her family 100% blamed her being in comedy. And that's where you reach out and support and say, we are your family. Yeah. We are there. And I've talked to people's parents and been like, yes, you can be a comedian without drinking alcohol. Yes, you can make it in Hollywood without sleeping with people. I haven't yet, but I've been told that it's possible. <laughs> this is a halal house, not a haram house. It's the halal, Muslim house. And I will say, though, to what comics are going to talk about on stage, they're artists. We want them to talk about what they want. There are comics who are political. There are comics who want to talk about their family. There are comics who want to dick, do dick jokes. We, you know, it's fine. Some, sometimes we do a show that, like, it's family friendly, and we tell them in advance. But barring that, you be who you are. And, and if you're honest, the audience gets it, and it resonates. Like, I, I'm a, in real life, I don't curse a lot. I don't talk about sex stuff a lot. That's life. That wouldn't resonate on stage. For other comics, it does. So they have to be honest. And comedy should challenge you. I think the best comedy makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. And there's some people, that's their choice, though, to do that. Like, I don't care if I talk about my Palestinian family. Just mentioning Palestine on stage, my dad's from Palestine, can make someone uncomfortable. Yeah. That's too bad. That's life. This is how it works. Art, all of you are artists or people who work in the arts. It's, there's nothing wrong with making people uncomfortable when you're making a point. That's how you challenge them. That's what art, to me, is the highest form, is challenging people through your art. But you have to be funny about it, and that's what comedy is about. So if you're funny, if you're not funny, you're giving a speech, and that's not the right fit for our festival. And just one quick thing. In our Arab festival, we've had Arab Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Buddhist, atheists. atheists. The Arab American Comedy Festival really is any religion or no religion, we don't care. Just so it's clear. The, we happen to be Muslim that run right. it, right. and whatever people are, we're like, that's we want it to be a celebration of all things Arab that includes being Muslim, but not exclusive to being Muslim. What, so this is, we have a few minutes left, and, and, and I, you've pushed the conversation right where I wanted to end, which is we've, I think we've talked a lot appropriately about um, the confronting discrimination it, 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 through the process of, of trying to be artists. But I wanna talk about like why comedy and the role of comedy, because I think sometimes people do think of it as levity. And in moments like this, it feels to me like there's always this hierarchy. It's like there's sort of you know, analytical knowledge you know, in, in written form, then there's news, then there's documentary, then maybe there's serious fiction, then there's drama and film, and then sort of like at the very bottom is comedy. But it seems to me like the bottom. Oh, forms, not, I, yeah. the bottom. But I'm saying that's sometimes the feeling <laughs> right, that people want to create that comedy isn't the place where sort of serious things are addressed. You guys obviously challenge that. Yeah. And so what is it that comedy can do that's distinct to comedy? Okay. So when we talk about making people uncomfortable, my actual presence, because I shake all the time from my cerebral palsy, it makes people incredibly uncomfortable. When Dean and I started the festival, we didn't actually realize at all that we were being revolutionary by putting me on stage. We were Arab, we were Muslim, we were confronting that. We weren't confronting the discrimination and like the loathing that society has for disabled people. So just by being ourselves and doing jokes about our lives, I go on stage and I do jokes about my life. So I didn't go out on stage and say, 
I'm going to make the world comfortable with cerebral palsy. I went out on stage. I made people laugh. They realized their bigotry and went home and did better. Or they saw themselves in Misfit Me and were like, hey, it's OK that I never got picked for gym or that people made fun of how I ate. Look at how badass that woman is now. And I call the disability community the disco. It's disability community disco, we're the party. But the reason that I use comedy is what Dean said. When you're making people laugh, they don't realize they're learning. When you make people laugh, they have done research about this in studies about violence against women. When you make people laugh, they are less likely to kill you. Like, they are literally less likely to harm you. They begin to see a human being. And when I'm a Muslim woman on stage, and the only image they have of Muslim women are women who are forced to wear a burqa by patriarchy and violence, and then they see me, they're like, oh, wait a minute. This is not what I thought it was. And when they see a disabled person and they realize that their whole life isn't inclusive or accessible, they're like, oh wait, I would date a disabled person. When you lecture people, they turn off. Mm -hmm. When you make people laugh, their heart literally starts beating differently. It engages, and you can get them to listen. But I don't always have a message. Sometimes I just talk about Beyonce. Yeah. And I really want That's you it. as artists <laughs> to not feel the burden of always having to tell a story that addresses our community's needs. But even if your story isn't about the community, include the community behind the camera, on the stage, wherever you can. But I mean, I use jokes because I want to do a one hour comedy special and that's the only way to get it. She's here. From <laughs> Anyone from Netflix here? I'm going to call it limping on the edge. <laughs> Look, I mean, it's exactly that. Comedy is a way to bring people in. It's inviting. It's warm. If you make someone laugh, they like you. And, and on my radio show, every night, I still start on Sirius XM, channel 127. <laughs> Three, 6 to 9 p.m. I begin every night by saying, I'm Dino Bidala. I want to be your MBFF, your Muslim best friend forever. Why? Because studies have shown if you know a Muslim, you like Muslims more, like any minority group. If you know someone from that community, it cuts through the stereotypes. They're human. They're your friend. That's why I want to sign everybody a Muslim friend. This is my dream. Maybe Duke Foundation, we can do this. <laughs> Everyone gets a Muslim friend. You'll learn about, like, baklap. So here's the one thing, last thing I'll say, though. I think comedy, though, I do audience shows in New York City in front of 99% are just non at the, white people, okay? It's mostly white people. And in that, you, you'd be amazed how open-minded they are. Like, I do a joke where I teach the crowd, but not, I don't go like, folk class, yeah. here's a lesson. I'll teach them, like, about being Arab, about being Muslim, about terms like inshallah. How many people here don't know what inshallah means? Anyone not know inshallah? Inshallah means God willing. It's an overused term by Muslims. It's used in situations that God wouldn't even care. <laughs> and I tell you, I was at a restaurant in Jordan, true story. I asked the waiter, where's the bathroom? He goes, it is over there. I go, I'll be right back. He goes, inshallah. <laughs> I'm like, what has happened in your bathroom? And then I tell people that. And then I have white people come up after the show and they go, I'll see you again, inshallah. So I'm like, they're learning. And that's how we take over. <laughs> inshallah. So, inshallah, inshallah, we take over, inshallah. So you all can find us on ArabComedy.com. Very easy, ArabComedy.com. If you look up Muslim comic, Dean comes up first. I'm after like 17 men who have barely done comedy, and then there's me. I love that. We went, we went a whole five minutes without a plug, so we had to do that. Yes, yes, we did. So this is, this is where I think we have to, we're going to have to wrap up. And, no, you know, I was... we're not leaving. We're staying here until Palestine is free. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Go ahead. Sam uh, has a flight. Go ahead. <laughs> but uh, you've already, I think, given one great piece of advice to, to young aspiring folks, which is promote your work. You've done a great job of that on stage. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, second piece of advice, ask the foundation that's present to fund your work. Um, but uh, but what, the place I actually want to end is that, which is I think I, I, hopefully what we've got here tonight, in addition to a lot of incredible, established, celebrated artists, are people who are you guys 20 years ago, who 
are trying to figure out what's the stage for me, what's the place for me, I got a story, I just gotta get out, how can I tell it? So I just would love to close by hearing from each of you, what's, if you could go back 20 years, what's one piece of, seeing what you've seen, learning what you've learned, but also confronting this moment, mm -hmm. what's one piece of advice you would give to yourself 20, 20 years ago? You wanna go first or me? Go ahead. Okay, uh, me 20 years ago, is one thing, but I teach at Princeton, so my advice to everybody is, writer's block doesn't exist, sit down and write it. If you want to prove that writer's block doesn't exist, pay your typist $30 an hour, it won't exist. You'll start writing really quickly. Writer's block doesn't exist, keep writing, do it. If no one else lets you do it, get on the open mics, get on, now you have unlimited access on the internet, just do it. And if you're terrible, if your dream turns into a nightmare, find another dream. Be willing to give up if you suck. It's really important. Now, my advice for me 20 years ago, stop crying about men. They're totally not worth it. Single life is the way to go. Marriage is a racket. Avoid it at all costs. <laughs> How you follow that? <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. 20 years ago, I was a lawyer, and <laughs> I was, and the best thing I ever did was, was pursue my dream. So for anyone out there, if there's nothing else you, in your brain when you're thinking, if all you're obsessed with making films, you're obsessed with being a comedian, you're obsessed with being a writer, be true to yourself. Do it. And even you might suck in the beginning, but you'll get better. If it's the only thing you feel like you can do, it's your calling in life. It's maktub. It is written for you. Go do it. Go boldly in the direction of your dreams. And it might work out. And if it doesn't work out exactly, I bet you something close will happen. But at least you'll be true to yourself. Because the worst thing is to look back from 20 years back. And I'd be a partner in a law firm going, I wish we did the comedy festival. I wish we tried to be funny. I wish we tried the documentary. You're all here. Go after your dreams. That is it. That's my. And inshallah, they will come true. Inshallah. May Sun Zaid Dino Thank you very much.